Hello! In this video we will now talk about how to access external data in your scene and bind them together in simple logics in order to visualize them or use them otherwise. One of Ventus' big advantages is the simplicity of using real-time data from outside Ventus. So in this tutorial we will have a look at how to exactly get them inside your scene and which types of data there are that you can use in Ventus. Every node that provides external data is a content node, since it does not have to affect the render process directly, but only output the data. The nodes can be found in the data category in the toolbox. The simplest node of these is the text file node. With it you can define a text file that should be loaded, and all it does is output its content as a string property that can for example be displayed with a 2D text node in the hierarchy. That can be found in the text category. Just place it in the hierarchy, select block text to also add a text provider to the renderer and click on the 2D text node to make it visible in the content editor. Here you can select the block text node and bind the text property to the text file node. Now everything that is written inside the text file will be displayed on screen. Like in other file loader nodes, you have two more properties regarding the loading of the text file. When auto update is turned on, the text file will receive an event from the Windows Explorer once the file has been changed, and it will reload it automatically. Once you change the file and save the changes, they will be updated automatically in your scene. The async flag tells the text file to load the file asynchronously from the renderer process. This will result in a behavior that there is no text for a small time span during the loading, but the renderer does not stutter for that time. Lastly, you can tell the node how the text file was encoded. Just use the one you chose when saving the file. Next, we can have a look at how to work with Excel Workbooks. Again, you first need a loader node, in this case called Excel Workbook. With it, you can search for and load a workbook file created with Microsoft Office. It outputs the workbook to be used in other nodes and the number of the sheets and their names. There are two types of nodes able to use an Excel workbook. First, you can use an Excel cell node, which is capable of returning the properties of one chosen cell in a specified sheet of that workbook. And second, there are the Excel range nodes, which will return the texts of a range of Excel cells as an array in Ventus. How exactly to handle arrays will be discussed a little later in this tutorial. When using an Excel cell node, you can define on which sheet and in which column and row to search in the workbook. It will return every property of the cell, like the fore and background colors, a text, number and date time, whatever is possible to pass to, a comment, and the name of the workbook sheet. With a range array node, you can either just read out all contents of a range of cells, pass to floats, or you can define which variable type to use in the array. The float array can for example be given to a line chart that is capable of visualizing float arrays. These two are already the most basic and common external data sources used in Ventus. Now let us take a very quick look at how to be able to handle these in order to visualize them in your scene. For this we will look at a use case. First we will build a very rough bar chart, not from scratch, but only from the point where the bar gets the value from an external source. This is the bar chart we will be working with. It has five bars consisting of cubes that are aligned to the bottom side and therefore scale in the direction of the y-axis. Everything else is just there for visual effects. And this is the Excel file that we would like to visualize. Nothing much in here besides five values in a column. First, we will need to get the values of the Excel sheet. Place an Excel workbook node, open your Excel file and get the range of your cells with an Excel range array node. Its length should be set to 5 and the read direction is a column. As an output you now have a float array. It cannot be bound to the size property of a cube directly to visualize each value with it. Instead, we will need an array indexer that can be found in the logic category, either by right-clicking on array processing or dragging and dropping it in the content editor. It will output a number of single values of the specified type. With the index property, you can choose where in the array to start to output the data. 
So let us create a float array indexer node with five outputs. Now we can bind the size y property to the according outputs. The problem? The cubes are now some hundreds of units high and actually we did not visualize anything this way. What we need to do is scale down the size y property so that the highest input value will be transferred into the highest good looking scaling of the bar and everything else is scaled by the same factor. There is a perfect node just for this use case, the clipping node. Just drag and drop it from the logic category under the math effects nodes directly on all of the five bindings. It will map an input value from an input range to an output range. The input range would be from zero to our highest value in the Excel sheet. The output range has to be zero to the highest possible scaling. Let us find out the best scaling by trial. Unbind one cube from the indexer again and try out the best scaling. I will use 6 as a reference. Input this to the output range of all clipping nodes. Also apparently our highest value in the Excel sheet is 500. Let us type that in as well. Now we already have perfect looking bar chart ready. The only problem, what happens when the maximum value in our workbook changes? We will also need to bind the maximum value of the input range in the clipping node to the maximum value of the whole Excel range. We also have a node for that. In the array processing nodes on the logic category you can find the float array analysis. It takes a float array and returns some very useful information about it. For example the maximum value. We can just bind its input to the output of the Excel range array node and the maximum values of the clipping nodes to the max output of the analysis node. Now whenever the values in the workbook change, the bar chart will update automatically and scale perfectly all the time. Lastly, let us take a look at two more sources of data that you can use and are a little bit more advanced but still very common. The XML file node is a more complex node than the text file node, which does not provide a string but an XML document in contrast to the text file node. XMLs are often used to save serialized objects from programs to the disk or transfer them over the internet. For example, Juventus project file is actually nothing else than an XML that represents all the settings and properties of your project. XMLs contain a tree structure with named nodes that have optional attributes and a value. The XML document can either be processed by an XSLT node or examined with an XPath expression node. XSLT is a programming language that can transform XML documents into other XMLs or human-readable documents. XPath is a query language for selecting specific parts of an XML document. It can be used to extract certain data from the XML and use it in your scene. It tries to pass the received data to all, a boolean, string, floating point number and integer number. All possible output properties will be filled with the data and can then be used again as inputs of other nodes of your scene. We can use this to get for example the text in the nodes nodes inside this XML document. Again we can display this on screen. When you want to use an already existing string as the reference document, you might use the XML text node. Instead of a URL, it takes a string and tries to create an XML document out of it that can then be used for an XSLT or XPath expression again. Please see the current references for the XSLT language and XPath expressions for further learning resources on this, since this is a very wide topic itself. You can also use JSON objects instead of XML documents. The use cases are very similar, although both languages have their definite advantages and disadvantages. Instead of using nodes and attributes like XML, it uses objects and fields. You can pass a JSON to Ventus properties with a JSON parser node. It has a string input to which you can pass your JSON. If you want to get a JSON from a file, you can use the text file node and pass its output to the JSON node. On the bottom you can add outputs to the node manually. The node searches for fields inside your JSON object named like your output properties. Also make sure that the JSON field can be passed to the type of your property. 
There are strings, numbers, integers and booleans and lists of each of them called arrays. Since you can nest JSONs inside JSONs, the output properties may again be a JSON object that you can then resolve using another JSON parser. If you want to output all the fields of the object, you can use the update button, which will create the output properties based on the loaded object. Also in JSON you can use unnamed arrays of JSON objects. If such an array is the input of the node, like you can see in this example JSON, you can use the index to switch between the different JSON objects in that array to be passed to the output. JSONs and XMLs can for example be used to save a configuration file for your scene. Their properties can then be used to change certain behaviors in your build scene. Also you can get them from the internet, for example by addressing social networks and displaying posts of users on a website. For further reference on JSONs and more learning resources on that topic, again see the current documentation of JSON, since this is a very wide topic that cannot be covered in the context of this video. This covers the most important types of external data sources and also how to bind them to an internal logic in your scene. Still, there is a whole lot more to learn about Ventus logic and you should also have a look at the variety of logic nodes in order to use them to their full potential and create very complex and fully automated scenes with them. This closes this tutorial. In the next video we will have a look at the deployment of your project and its maintenance.